Gavin Sherry. Gavin Sherry got his start in technology when he pulled a computer out of a dumpster and taught himself how to cook. Being a founder is challenging for a lot of reasons. One is like uncertainty. The best solution we can have is to bring on a diverse set of advisors, mentors, people we can lean on to get their perspective. And with more than 20 years experience in data processing, machine learning, open source, cloud and large scale internet systems. If I'm going to do something, I really want to develop mastery. We went from making wine in France to diving in California to starting a company. Had these like two competing things, almost like this passion for wine and the other was architecting and building database technology. You become wealthy, you achieve success and life gets harder. What do I do now? What summit do I conquer from here? Six years making wine in France. What are the lessons that you can take away that you think made you better at becoming a tech entrepreneur? I'm really excited to have you on the show, Gavin. Thanks, Vinny. Glad to be here. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you're, you're Australian. I'm South I, African. I am Australian. We're, we're you know, probably we're former rugby fans. Brothers, uh, <laughs> cousins. <laughs> exactly. I say former because it's really hard watching rugby when you're uh, in the States. Um, but we, you know, South African, I'm very proud that our yeah, team. Yeah, congrats on the World Cup. Yep. Fourth World Cup win. So, you know, Amazing. Yeah, it's been great. But, um, you know, I, I'd love to just start off with the background. Where in Australia were you born? And how did you, yeah, how did you wind you up in France? Like, let's get to that quickly because I'm really interested <laughs> Hollywood. Makes sense. Made wine um, in France. Yeah, I, I, I grew up in Sydney, Australia. Uh, had the typical Australian kind of upbringing, um, like Catholic school, surfing, beach, stuff Tall like poppy that. syndrome. <laughs> A lot of tall poppy syndrome. I, I wouldn't be Australian without it. Um, knew I wanted to, to be somewhere other than Australia. Spent time in uh, Japan uh, and eventually made my way to France, largely out of like a passion for wine. Okay. Uh, I'd studied. Uh, How old were you when you got there? Uh, I was 27 when I moved there permanently, okay. around about 2003, so four years beforehand. Uh, I started studying for the Master of Wine. Oh, wow. Which was okay. like a big kind of deal at the time. There well, what, what did you do before you did that? Like, what was your. I, I was working in open source. I was working okay. on Postgres, okay. chiefly like a pretty, pretty famous open okay. source database. Uh, I also just love databases as yeah. well as wine and many other things. So you just decided one day, fuck it, I'm going to move to. Uh, kind of. Like, I was working remotely uh, a lot for American companies. Uh, I'd run like my own kind of consulting business in the area of open source. So I had that flexibility, knew I didn't want to be in Australia. Mm hmm. I uh, had fallen in love with France for many just international trips, like business trips. Uh, had done an amazing tour of France, like the kind of tour that, that people can do mm. when they're younger, that have yeah. kids, um, in 2005. And then we just set our minds to moving to France in 2007. Okay. I find that very interesting because a lot of the immigrant entrepreneurs uh, from around the world, like you, you make up your mind that you don't want to be in your country anymore. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you're now based in Silicon Valley. Um, you know, I'm now in San Diego after being in the Valley for about a decade. Right. So, so we, we, we kind of just realized that like there's this glass ceiling. Um, yeah. It's just not working for us. And, you know, I think a lot of people go through that period where they just realize that they just don't fit into the society they were born. 100%. In. Isn't it true, right? It is true. I mean, I, I had these kind of probably two moments in my life. One was when I arrived in Paris one time. I was like, oh, I'm home. Um, th this seems like more familiar than my upbringing. And another time was was in Silicon Valley. It's yeah. like, oh, these are my people. You find they understand people. me. Exactly. Um, exactly. I feel more, I identify with the people here. I feel more mm -hmm. accepted here than than elsewhere. And yeah. Yeah, you clearly have experienced that as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not, I mean, for me, it wasn't the, the acceptance thing. I, I think I was a pretty, I got to a point where I was pretty well accepted in South Africa. And I, like, I had my people there. The problem is, like the infrastructure is crumbling, mm -hmm. and this is yeah. 15 years ago. It's just gotten worse. So I, I was kind of okay. I, I, you know, I can't work on dial-up. <laughs> you know, I can't have power <laughs> outages every two hours when I'm running a tech company, and I had to leave. And then when I got to Silicon Valley, it was like this is what I want to be doing. This yeah. is the tech, and it was an amazing experience for me. But I, I had made up my mind that I wanted to leave South Africa probably many years before I actually got to Silicon Valley. It took a long time. Mm -hmm. I mean, visas and whatever else. Yeah. It's a nightmare, right, getting into, this, into the States. <laughs> it still is, unfortunately. Yeah. But, okay, so so you made up your mind, you packed your bags, you went to France. That's right. During the financial crisis, no less. I mean, of course. Like, what, <laughs> when else would you do it, right? <laughs> yeah, I was I was architecting uh, this database system called Greenplum. Okay. And I would sort of do that at night, like U.S. hours. Okay. And during the day, it was it was about wine. Oh, so you're and, working remotely? Yeah, working remotely Amazing. from a tiny town called Bone. Uh, what sort of internet like, did you have? 
Um, look, France from a very early time had extremely good DSL okay. internet. Okay. It's, it was kind of famous for that. Like okay. they had this, this great internet service provider. Uh, so it was better than the States at the time, actually. Uh, so that was fine. It was so you were able to make money while you were... Totally, yeah. I, I, I worked super hard. I, I learned a lot. Um, Greenplum was an amazing database. Also had a fantastic outcome. We sold to EMC in 2010. Oh, fantastic. Uh, which was like a, just a rough time for tech, as, as you recall. I remember Greenplum. Why do you remember? It sounds familiar. Uh, I don't know. It was like a big deal at the time. Yeah. Like it, it, and it was the formation. It was one of the constituent pieces of Pivotal, which is uh, you know, one of the companies that I, I worked at later on. But um, yeah, I had these like two kind of competing things happening in my life. One was like this passion for wine and viticulture, uh, and the other was like this extremely serious job around like architecting and building database technology and our customers were like New York Stock Exchange, yeah, yeah. NASDAQ, awesome. um, DTCC, et cetera. Okay. So let's park the tech stuff for a while because I really <laughs> want to focus on the wine here. Love to. So, so you, you started studying the Masters of Wine. Tell mm -hmm. us what is the Masters of Wine and, 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 and how did you get into it? And you know. Yeah, I tend to be a person that if I'm going to do something, like I, I really want to develop mastery in it. And, uh, you know, I, I had enjoyed wine, like a lot of people, you know, you encounter it like, oh, that tastes pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wanted to learn more. I had a thirst for it. Uh, Sydney is close to a wine region. So I would go there, visit and ask, you know, winemakers mm -hmm. and, and the people who worked at the wineries, like, how do I learn more? Uh, and somehow I fell in with a group of people, I didn't actually exactly remember how, who were like way more technically serious about wine. They were like in wine distribution mm -hmm. and so on. Um, and they all wanted to study this this Masters of Wine. It was the first or second cohort from Australia. It was a pretty small time thing. There were only about 300 Masters of Wine in the world at the time. And it was a grueling like three year process of study. I ended up not completing it because I didn't want to work in the wine industry like permanently. I could see that my passion was wine rather than like my working life being wine because I was also just mm. really into technology so, as well. So, I mean, getting this master wise, like a certification or, or, or yeah, a Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, yeah, it's a certification. It's a three year process. So what does it, what does it give you if you get that? Because you didn't get it, right? So you, I, I, yeah. I decided not to complete it. Um, but what, what, you, what did you what did you leave on the table? At the time, people who had a master's of wine would typically become um, large scale buyers of okay. wine, like the biggest wine buyers in the world. They would maybe run consulting groups to okay. purchase wine for restaurants or hotels. So it was, or more, it was more about the industry, the wine industry. Very focused on using your tasting ability and knowledge of mm -hmm. wine to select the optimal wines for some particular purpose. Okay. It's probably, at least in the United States, been overtaken by the sort of master sommelier yeah, yeah, yeah. program. They're probably equivalent. I don't know much about okay. the sommelier uh, program. I didn't want to be a sommelier or anything like that. I was just trying to develop deep knowledge and know-how with respect to wine for my own kind of interest and okay. pleasure. So where, so where in France did you go to? Uh, we lived in Paris and in and in Bone. Um, Bone is like the epicenter of Burgundy. Okay. Um, it's like the viticultural heart of, of Burgundy. Uh, it's a very ancient town, two thousand five hundred years old. I lived in the the ramparts of, of the town, okay. uh, and it's surrounded by vineyards on all sides. Uh, to the south is basically where the great white wines of Burgundy are made, like the Chardonnays, and then to the north is for the large part not. Not exclusively, but the, where the Pinots mm. are planted. And to my mind, this is where the best Chardonnay and Pinot Noir uh, come from in the world. Um, a lot of extremely experienced wine people tend to believe that as well. And uh, those were my two kind of favorite styles of wine. Okay, so so, you, so you, you went from software to winemaking. Like, t tell me what the... Like what is it? What is the drudgery part of the job? What did you have to do? Like, which? You, oh, in wine, it, it's yeah. it's drudgery all the time. Okay. Um, in France, it's different to the United States, but in France, they believe that like the wine is made in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. They don't tend to talk about winemakers as being a thing. In fact, when they refer to winemakers, they usually say like le winemaker, okay, uh, rather than vigneron, which means grape grower. Okay. 
Uh, so yeah, so it's like, mostly like hard farm laboring work. Like when I go to Napa and so on, like I'm more interested in talking to the, the vineyard workers than to like the kind of famous winemaker okay. uh, whose name is like on the back of the bottle. What would you say the lessons that you learned from making wine you know, or that experience? Because you were there for how many, six years? Yeah, six years in total. Six years making wine in France. Like I'm sure you have a ton of lessons. What are the lessons that you can take away and share that you think made you better at becoming a tech entrepreneur? The most critical lesson that's very hard to understand the ramifications of is around feedback cycles. Mm -hmm. The most experienced grape grower or winemaker is actually extremely inexperienced relative to say a surgeon who gets to practice their art every single day. Mm. And they get very fast. Like, did they cut the patient? Is the kill season them? <laughs> yeah, like once a year? Yeah, it's like you, you only get to sort of make it once yeah. a year. You might make as a like a flying winemaker, like a Michel Roland. You might make a hundred wines a year. Most people make five wines a year, uh, and then you might have to wait five, ten, fifteen years. Maybe more like five to understand. Like, well, did I do a good job or not? So it's a very That's long, very, very long unusual, but extremely similar to company creation. Yeah. So the feedback cycle. You had you had long feedback cycles, which were detrimental to you. I mean, yeah, you have you, partial you, you information. Don't, you don't progress as quickly. Yeah, you have partial information. You're trying to make decisions. Okay. Uh, you're doing. You're trying to be scientific, but often you can't be scientific because of the inexact or imprecise or partial information that you have. You have to use instinct. You have to solicit inputs from people who have more experience from you and really listen to it and be aware of your own biases. Mm particularly those biases that come from the subjectivity of our senses. Because winemaking is about, sure. like, does it smell good? Does it look good? Does it taste good? And, you know, did you just, are you trying the wine after lunch? Like, you know, like, to what degree are your senses impaired by mm. your day, your life, a cold, et cetera? What would you say was the scariest moment for you in, 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 in that six-year stint making wine? Like, I'm we're not aware we're, of anything. Well, not scary. Scary in the sense of, like, ah, oh, I screwed up. Hi, this is Vinny. Thank you for being a viewer or subscriber to my channel. And if you are a viewer and not a subscriber, please hit the subscribe button. I love producing content for you guys, and I really, really appreciate all the feedback and the comments that you post. I want to hear from you about which guests you want to see on my show, and more importantly, which questions you want to ask them. I'm going to try my best to get them on just for you. Thanks so much, and now back to the show. There wasn't anything... Um, like that, but I'll answer the question in a different way. It was like acceptance, actually. It's the reason why I decided to leave France and, and come okay. here, which was, you know, I was l'étranger, the foreigner, uh -huh. uh, the stranger. Um, it's even Burgundy in particular is a pretty insular uh, yeah. place. Uh, it's a very traditional uh, part of France. And uh, it was scary to think about one's life as they progressed and not have that, um, sense of belonging, sense of belonging and companionship that I felt more in in the United States. So you packed your bags and you went to the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, you told me at some point that you were doing diving. Yeah. <laughs> when was this? Well, you know, everything changed once once we moved to the states and uh, we didn't have kids yet. Uh, Bay Area is close to Monterey. One of the great things about the Bay Area is like access to to the outdoors and to the ocean. And uh, I went and did like a dive certification, uh, went and started diving off of, of Monterey, went to um, like Tulum for, or Playa del Carmen for, for Christmas, absolutely just fell in love with diving, particularly diving in cenotes. And it's similar to other aspects of my life, including wine, but there was always this like kind of mysterious thing around a corner and I wanted to know what it was. And like that was like a, a cave system that required a high degree of certification and experience to explore. And I told my guide I, I wanted to go in there. He said no because it's very risky. But he, he said that he would certify me when I had enough experience. How deep was it? Um, some of the caves are very deep. The, the way that one talks about caves is usually like the penetration depth, like how far they are, are away from oxygen or air. Uh, look, I've gone for many hours in into cave uh hours systems. underwater yeah does um, the tank last that long well you take more than one okay. you always take at least two into a cave um sometimes three or four uh, and you might stage tanks along the way so you'd like do setup dives oh, okay and then come when you're actually doing the dive you 
kind of empty a tank, maybe two thirds of a tank, and then pull up a, a new tank from that you've staged in previous days. Wow. And so, did you ever get the bends? Uh, thankfully, no. Oh, um, but I've seen people um, with the bends or with DCS, yeah, decompressions in room. So, how uh, deep do you have to go for that? Um, it's a fu- it's a multivariable problem. It's a function of depth and of, yeah. of how fast you're ascending. Yeah. Um, we went to a, a really beautiful cave system called Zapote to see a thing called the Hell's Bells. It's like these very unusual, mm. like you know, many millions of years old formations inside of some caves near Cancun. And one of the people, a photographer was with us taking photos of us. They're extremely picturesque, extremely beautiful. And he got DCS uh, at the time and and he was on the same dive profile. He was in great physical condition, but it's a sort of random thing. It's a biological process, a biological and chemical process. So. It's one of the reasons I've never done it. I'm like paranoid. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be scared about that. I mean, you can, you can be within 30 feet. You're never going to get DCS. Okay. Even if you like shoot to the surface, you, you won't get DCS. Okay, 30 feet. Okay, I might try a 30 foot dive. 30 feet in that part of the world is you can see a lot. Okay, great. So you went from uh, making wine in France to diving in California to starting uh, a company. Yeah. That uh, autonomic, and you know, mm-hmm. we've had uh, your co-founder Sunny. Yeah. Uh, previously on on a previous episode. Um, so I won't dive too much into that, but um, you know, I, I really want to understand from you what your, what your thoughts are on you know immigrant founders in the mm. Bay Area, because I think a lot of uh, immigrant founders come to America. You know, it's the American dream, right? The land of opportunity, searching their dreams. And, and you came and you did it. You you know, you, you co-founded a company did, yeah. with another yeah, immigrant. A bit kind of goosebumps, right? Thinking yeah. about it. But. Yeah, with another immigrant founder. You know, Sunny is immigrant as well. And you guys had a, a, a big exit to Ford. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, like what advice would you give to other founders out there from around the world watching this who, you know, they want to come to America. They want to go to Silicon Valley. They want to start a company. They want to go and chase their dreams. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, you did it. Yeah. I mean, look, there's so many little lessons. I mean, I, I guess the, the key one would be to find someone who can take you through all those lessons in detail and be there for you. Um, when like a you lawyer or? No, like someone who's done it. Oh, okay. not, not like someone who talks about it. Um, but I said like, lawyer because, because, like because, no, because it's the, the practical point is like my, the, first person I, the first person I met in Silicon Valley was the only person I met, but the first most important person I met was my lawyer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he helped me get the green card or the green card, the visas before I got a green card and then citizenship. But he helped me get into the valley. And that's that's the hard part for a lot of people. I mean, mm-hmm. the easy part is buy a ticket and come visit. But the, the hard part is actually getting, you know, coming in legally. Yeah, coming legally, yeah. getting set up. I think that we're at a really great time now that was different from when you and I did it. Yeah. Which is that you can establish right a business. The <laughs> <laughs> you can establish a business uh, abroad, anywhere in the world: South Africa, Australia, India, or Iceland, if if you like, or if that's where you're based. Uh, you can launch a business. You can learn the lessons of Silicon Valley that that we cherish. Mm-hmm. Um, begin to build, then um, meet and get get kind of fun to get access to immigration and so on. Apply for an O one. Mm-hmm. visa because you've already established your credentials mm-hmm. as being like candidly the kind of person that makes to be in America. Yeah, yeah, like works, yeah. like that that's why we're here. And it's really that like it's that simple in my mind. I mean it's there's it's an imperfect country but but one of its virtues is is meritocracy. Yeah. I mean you know on the topic of immigration reform, like I'll just wax a bit here because I, I think we all agree that we should have the smartest and brightest people in the world. Why wouldn't we successful want that? coming here? The problem is, like, I don't know, Congress and and you know, the, the, just the government in general is always trying to package that part of the pack of the reform package with everything else. Like, we're mm-hmm. not going to give the ability for people who, come, who are successful to come across without fixing whatever you know parts of the of, of immigration they want to have reformed. And I think it's a bit short-sighted because, let's be honest, they, it's been decades yeah. and they can't fix it. So why don't you just pass a, a very simple bill saying if you are successful in some part of the world with some criteria, I mean, Canada does it, Australia right. does it, yeah, b- a basic point system, if you have a medical degree, if you have this, that, et cetera, you can walk into the U.S., you hit the – and maybe even make it a little bit high, a high bar initially to get people in. It seems very intuitive, uh, but the politics. But behind it is, there's a lot of politics around immigration, as we know. Also, society is bigger than than technology in Silicon Valley. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that if we were to take a very 
uh, idealistic view of democracy than our representatives are seeking to solve for society's problems in general, not mm. say Silicon Valley's problems. Mm. But it's <laughs> that being said, it's so hard to accept the idea that we wouldn't welcome with open arms the world's greatest minds. Absolutely, who want to America propel built this country that. forward. America was built in that. I mean, pre World War One. Uh, you know, even a little bit afterwards, like we were, you know, scientists would come to America to do research. It's still, look, it's still incredible. It remains um, the the um, highest achieving country mm. for, you know, capitalists and intellectuals yeah. uh, in the world. It it just feels as though you and I know and, and our peers know like an even better way, an even better system. And it is frustrating that that we're not living in that system today. Yeah. Going through your startup journey um, and as a startup founder, what do you think you wish you knew then that you didn't, that you know now? Like, what? give me an example of something which, you know, you've learned, you, you've learned the hard lessons on. It's uh, similar to the wine example mm -hmm. I gave before of, like, there's very little that can compete with, like, knowing how something ends so that you can recognize the patterns early on. Being a founder is challenging for a lot of reasons. One is like uncertainty mm -hmm. and living with a great deal of uncertainty. And the solution for it, I think the best solution we can have is to bring on uh, a diverse set of advisors, mm -hmm. um, mentors, people we can lean on to get their perspective. It can be overdone. Like if you're trying to find the average opinion of a whole mm. host of, of intellectuals or from a brain trust, you won't develop the muscle necessary to make very instinctual, rapid decisions. But uh, having a skill of understanding where uncertainty lies, what where the one-way doors as opposed to like two-way mm. doors are and, and how to get the best advice uh, on that is is probably the thing that was, it's not intuitive up front, but mm. I, I wish I knew at the time. Hmm. It's interesting. I mean, one of the things I noticed in, in, in the Valley is that uh, there's a lot of opportunity to get advisors. Mm -hmm. There's so many people there that have worked in tech for years. Uh, whereas I think other parts of the world, the advisors you get with no experience mm -hmm. at all. They just haven't done anything. And well, the good news is we have uh, AI now. Yeah. <laughs> so you well, can exactly. coach uh, ChatGPT or one of its rivals into being a good mentor yeah. uh, in a way that we couldn't. Mm -hmm. In our in earlier times. Well, I think it's changed though. Uh, I think now with you know post COVID, we have video conferencing tools and software. People are, are you know like for me initially in the Valley, I was trying to find the right people to meet up with and right. early two thousand. Now I think anyway, you can get advisors from around the world if they have time. It was very much about meeting in person. Yeah. In in our early yeah. era, uh, definitely not the case now. You're right. Let's talk about AI. Now that you touched on that. <laughs> um, What's your favorite AI uh, project right now that you're seeing? Well, like, what do you use the most? Look, I'll, I'll say I use ChatGPT the most. Sure. Uh, we're you know, building an AI company, mm -hmm. as, as Sunny probably shared in yeah. an earlier episode. Haven't watched it yet since yeah. it was shot two hours ago. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. um, um, I, I use it a lot. It's installed on my phone. Uh, it's one of my like most used apps. Mm. Uh, I use it in a different way to a lot of people because our company does like a lot of prompt engineering mm. and, and building of technology in, in the space. But uh, also make use of uh, a lot of other like rival large language model uh, systems like BARD, like uh, mm. the Bing chat or AI. They keep on renaming it. Mm. Uh, but chiefly, um, chiefly chat GPT. What use case for AI hasn't hit mainstream yet that you think will? I think it comes down to – here's like a moment that was like a real eye-opener for me. I was um, consuming some academic papers mm -hmm. in the area of mathematics and – I didn't really understand what they were talking about. I think I was reading the words that were familiar to me. I understood the mathematical notation, but I didn't have a deep understanding of or an intuitive mental model for what was happening. Mm. And by interacting as I was reading the paper with ChatGPT in this case, I was able to develop a deep, intuitive um, mental model of exactly what the paper was explaining. In a way that I had not, I, I studied pure mathematics, like in a way so that I just hadn't today. You the PDF into 
ChatGPT or in this I could have done that, but in this particular case, I was just posing problems from the paper okay. my, myself as like a side by side. Uh, but in all of my education, all of my self learning throughout my entire career, I had never been in a position where I felt like I had um, a completely honest um, tutor who could work with me at the level that I was at. And I didn't feel any shame about mm. interacting like with, you know, a data structure, you know, with an API. I mean, it's pretty impressive it. how, you know, it's a good point you make. These AI tools have basically taken away the insecurities that people have with asking that's, other That's what I'm getting humans. at. Yeah. That, that for many people, maybe all, um, there is insecurity, there's, there's shame, there's shame. Shame. embarrassment, yeah, yeah. there's pride. Uh, but I know that like, I don't need to be ashamed of like what, like a data structure mm -hmm. <laughs> thinks no, about but me. So, so, sometimes you, if you're on the job, you're like, I don't want to ask this person how this thing works. Yeah, you, you don't want to look dumb. Because you look dumb in front of your colleagues. You're like, oh, let me just, but you just pull out your phone, type in chat, you and you have it in seconds, right? Like I, I've right. said in meetings or online meetings where I'm having a meeting with someone and uh, they say something. I'm like, what the heck did they just right. say? <laughs> Type it into ChatGPT on a different browser tab, and then you can, oh, that's what they mean, and you can have a conversation about it. That that's a real immediate unlock yeah. and a massive productivity enhancer yeah. for, say, people like us. Yeah, we yeah. we we want to appear smart in every possible context. Well, it's not about being smart. I don't want to waste time like asking. Like, in fact, for me, it's not even an embarrassing thing. Right. It's like there's four people on the call. Someone just says something. Yeah, I'm like, what does yeah, that it's mean? At a okay, cool. Speed. Instead of it's like, hey guys, slow down, explain this to me. Right. That's just stops the flow of the conversation. So you're so, exactly right. So you can you can use it to enhance conversations mm -hmm. uh, that you're having. I mean, I've been using it for uh, I mean so many different things. One example was I was trying to do some math on um, you know permutations of uh, you know eight digit uh, combinations of alpha alpha numeric mm -hmm. characters, right? And I was trying to find what the optimal number of characters were for like digital identity. Mm -hmm. And you know. Uh, you can run through the different permutations, and in some cases, we're spitting out like 77 billion and then 4.2 trillion. And I'm like, right. well, we're never gonna have 4.2 trillion people on earth, like, right? So, yeah, so, I don't need that many ID numbers. So, you know, I managed, managed to like tweak it a bit, but it took me like a minute, right? Or two. And even though I was using a calculator to just do these the sums, I get mm -hmm. the eBay, you know, the exponential number, right? Uh, t uh, you wouldn't be able to display on screen. Um, and it just changes everything that you can, uh, and you can do it in, in plain English. Right. It's like I'm trying to create this type of system. Yes. I need this, 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 that. Yeah. And and you know, and what are the options? And it goes. Yeah. You can come seconds. like out of domain. Yeah. Um, speak out of domain, but get like an in-domain answer mm -hmm. that is kind of factual and verifiable, and then have it translated back into the domain of, of your understanding. And how I, would I think, you how would you change the school system today? Oh wow, that that is. An interesting because tangent. AI changes everything. Like what, what, you know, yeah, the kids are busy memorizing crap they're never going to have to know, and they can always just type into well, ChatGPT. You're, and get... you're exactly right. There's obviously been a rise, and this always happens when we have these fantastic yeah. you know, innovations inflection in society. Point. It's an inflection point in humanity. Where actually. some people like want to stop it, uh, they want to preserve the old way. Uh, yeah. To me, like when we look at recruiting, when I look at educating my my daughter. Um, Obviously, like the best prompters are going to have like the best outcomes Absolutely. in life at this point. Yeah. And the reason for that is it comes down to being able to ask the best questions. Yes. And that that is the absolute magical thing about large language models is it reduces all problems down to what the key problem is. Mm -hmm. Like that creativity and imagination and analytical ability to pose a problem in a way that elicits the response, not the response itself, which is memorization. And, and let's so talk about let's talk about schooling. Like, what is the point of schooling? Well, I think fundamentally, it's giving you the ability to uh, you know, obviously you know teach you how to learn, mm -hmm. so you can go to university and, and and study, and that's kind of the traditional way of doing it. Because you do stuff which you never really. I, mean, I can't remember anything from my history class mm -hmm. and my biology class. Like very very like you know, small snippets of stuff from high school. Like who remembers that stuff? Mm -hmm. uh, but everything I learned. You know, on the job, mm -hmm. I've kind of have with me. It's all, it's all, yeah, it's all I, I'm up. very much the same. It's like I always talk about like using things in anger. Yeah. Like when you have to really do something, like that's mm -hmm. when you really yes. memorize it for yes. reasons that are probably intuitive. But but we have this process where you 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 have to learn how to learn, and that's generally school, and then you ditch all the stuff you've learned because it's pretty useless. It's kind of mm -hmm. like just training data. Well, there, there, there's, 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 learning <laughs> there's, learning, yeah, there's learning to learn. There's learning to learn. 
which I think is is critical. It There's is obviously a, a bunch of other important. things like and, socialization. And, and, yeah, and, and, and I think and basic so math and high school math's fine and, and science. Like some of the hard stuff is really good. And then you go off to university. Mm -hmm. And now the question I've got is like, when I think back on my university days, it was more about learning concepts, not content. Because if I look at the way I operate today, I'm very much a conceptual person, mm -hmm. not a content person. You ask me specific things about, right. I'm like, I don't have the depth of knowledge. To that. But yeah. conceptually, I really understand certain things well enough to be able to operate in those environments. Right. Like I haven't written code in probably about a decade, like properly, but I understand it. I programmed it. I, that's what I studied. Uh, I conceptually, I'm not the best programmer right. in the world because I just haven't got years of experience behind it. Right. But conceptually, I understand how it you works. You have a, a mental framework. A framework for, for, for what's, exactly. what's going on. And, and interestingly enough, I mean, that's largely what's happening inside of like neural networks, yeah. which is they have a conception of, um, say, knowledge in general. Mm -hmm. um, but they don't encode all knowledge in like this kind of rote way, which you're implicitly kind of criticizing well, our school e system e for. Even you can do stuff like take an, uh, you know, set of API docs, dump it into ChatGPT and mm -hmm. ask it like, hey, can this API do this and that? Yeah. And it'll figure it out for you pretty quickly. Well, there, there's a beautiful aspect of, of you know, GPT-4 in particular, but of, of other large language models, which is, and we, we do this a lot at, at Definitive, you put an API specification into it and ask it like what its properties are. Try to like understand at a at a meta physical yep. kind of level like like the properties of this system and how comprehensible it is. And interestingly enough, because of let's the reflection of the pre training of, mm -hmm. of the models, but interestingly enough, it it tries to simplify APIs in a way that um, like an average programmer could understand them rather than like the most sophisticated programmer mm. or most talented uh, programmer. And that tends to have a lot of benefits for people who are producing APIs to be consumed mm. by large numbers of developers. Obviously, it's a function of the, the pre-training of the model because it is trying to um, elicit a, um, a representative response, mm. like the average response of the internet. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's incredibly helpful in, in that regard mm. and, and very educational for someone who I, I, can complicate things, right? Yeah, I use it for lots of like uh, weird things. Like I was once trying to figure out an old movie that I saw mm. and I started typing in, you know, I can't remember what it was, but I was like, I'm looking for a movie that was made in the 80s mm -hmm. or the 90s that had this type of character doing this sort of thing. And it actually gave me a list of 10. It was in the 10. It was like it was amazing. So it makes sense. Yeah. So so like you can give it very sparse amounts of data, and ask for it to, like at least give you. Yeah, and and that's a really intuitive. I've said the word intuitive a lot, but you know that's a very human thing to do of say saying like, like I have the answer. Of what's the question? Yes, that's like yeah, a yeah. really human way of thinking. Yeah. I I find, and we haven't to date built software systems mm. that behave like that which is, is really fascinating. I, I think one of the problems I've got with uh, like OpenAI particularly and, and, and all the, a, lot, a lot of these systems is that they, they put guardrails on a lot of data mm. when it relates to medical. Mm. So when I'm searching for like things about supplementation and impact on your body and you're like, does this new supplement do this? Mm -hmm. It's like always giving disclaimers, speak to you, and then it doesn't want to give you an actual answer. It says, I can't mm -hmm. tell you whether this is good or not. And it probably could. So from the research papers it has, from the data it's got, it's ingested, you could say to it, hey, does vitamin D offer a health benefits? You know, it won't give you an answer because it's very scared of like liability, mm -hmm. et cetera. It'll say, based upon data, it probably has, but you should contact, you, you should you know, consult right. with your, your physician. And they're putting more and more guardrails. That's just one topic. There are a lot of topics out there they're putting guardrails around, which I think is a little bit problematic for me because- you know, maybe it should be done based upon like you know the user sophistication level, maybe the age. Maybe you say, "Hey, mm -hmm. I want unfiltered. I'll take the risks associated with it." Mm -hmm. You know, some like something along those lines. I'm a bit concerned that that we, we you know I'm concerned that they the corralling us into. I, a, a I understand view. your concerns around like kind of dumbing things down. Yeah. Uh, the counterpoint would be, I think, a problematic aspect of. Actually, ChatGPT in particular is like the sycophantic bias of like really wanting to placate and please and pander mm. to the user. That's a function of its of its fine tuning and the hallucinations and and related to it is hallucination. It would rather give you a, a wrong it, answer. It would rather as if it's like alive, but it it tends to give answers where um, 
an answer would answering the question at all would be inappropriate yeah. because there's no yeah, yeah. answer, for example. And I think that that'll be an area of research for for the industry. Interesting. Um, let's change tech a bit. Uh, go go to crypto. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on crypto? You know, I am probably most attracted to the systems ideas of, of crypto. Um, Patrick McKenzie calls crypto um, an extremely, I'm misquoting him, but extremely elegant, um, very slow database. I think it has, I'll, I'll say take Ethereum as, as an example, or maybe mm -hmm. Bitcoin as a more simplistic example. Uh, very fascinating technological properties. Mm -hmm. I think that the utility or utilities of crypto have not been fully realized yet. DeFi is, is mm -hmm. one of them, but that's like an internal part of, of crypto. I think the, the utility for the rest of the world has not been fully realized, although it felt like we were going to get there. Mm -hmm. uh, just not fully realized yet. I was thinking about actually just coincidentally payments mm -hmm. this morning and about how many the problems that relate to payments are not technological mm -hmm. in nature. So They're sure. more about systems of trust yeah. and how to undo mistakes and all that kind of stuff that – in many ways, it's, it's interesting because, like, as engineers, we try to – we tend to equate the most important problem as, like, the techno technically most complex problem. Mm. But I don't think it's the case in, no, in the area of payments, and that's why I don't think payments took off with uh, with crypto. Okay. So, Gavin, you've lived a very interesting life <laughs> from all I can gather and from what you've told me. What is the scariest moment in your life? Well, like, I, I, you know, all your years, where were you the most, like – scared like i um i did get into some trouble cave diving okay uh tell us more about that one of the rules of cave diving is to never cave dive alone because it's redundancy in all things so of Makes course sense. what do i do i cave dive alone of course you did um yeah, laughing because you're, sitting, you're, you're <laughs> sitting opposite me today so no matter how bad the story is i think you're okay but i want to um, hear this yeah i i there were three. There were three times this happened because, like, I didn't learn my lesson the first time. Oh, jeez. Um, okay. It changes when you have kids, incidentally. Yeah. Right. Um, but the first time, uh, you know, I kicked up a lot of sediment from mm -hmm. the bottom of the cave, so I, I lo completely lost visibility, and I got entangled in in the, there are lines that are like you know, cave lines, so mm -hmm. you can find your way. And I got kind of tangled in it, and I I couldn't get off, and I, I couldn't see anything. Are you panicking? Uh, trying not to panic. Uh, you train for panic. Uh, it's part of the reason I like it, like that sense of like controlling okay. my mind and, and my emotions and yep. my breathing. Uh, and so you're trying to just breathe slowly, not panic. You have like a good five to ten minutes to kind of work this out. It'll be okay. In the back of your mind is this like ticking clock, right, that's really playing on your mind. Uh, that was probably not that scary, uh, the most scary time was I'd done a very, very long solo dive, probably like five or six hours. And I'd found- Was someone above the bo in the boat? It's not, it's not a boat, it's inland. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it was, in, it was in the jungle near Tulum, Mexico. Oh, geez. And- Were you just uh, by yourself? Just by myself. And- um, Crazy. <laughs> kind, of, kind of weirdly, like there was a rave going on nearby. Uh, it was the BPM- Okay. Uh, festival uh, near, nearby. It used to be in, in Tulum. And uh, so I could kind of hear like the sound of, of the rave. But uh, I discovered this this extension of a cave that was extremely beautiful. There was all these like kind of crystals in there. Like I, I just didn't want to leave. Like, it was like one of the most beautiful things I'd ever seen. I wasn't paying attention to how much air I'd consumed uh, it's pretty complicated in, in cave diving because mm -hmm. you have all these tanks like I referred to before. And I was kicking back. It was like a long kick back, maybe an hour and a half uh, to get to the surface. And I realized that I had made a pretty substantial error in the calculation of the amount of air I would need or that I had used. And How deep were you? The the My absolute level was very shallow, probably only about 25 feet, but – it doesn't really matter when there's rock above you, right? Oh, like, so sure it's, it's, it's okay. water straight to the, the ceiling okay. of the cave. 
there's no amount of like you can't dig your way out. Sure. Like it's 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 a meter or two of solid rock above you. You're not you're not digging your way out. There's no air above between so the water back. and the ceiling. So you have to go back the way you came, basically. Oh, okay. uh, which is why it's so dangerous. Sure. And uh there's a moment that if there's any like divers or cave divers watching will be a very scary moment for them, which is when you breathe the last breath out of the last tank. Oh, and there's a, a an incredible resistance on the regulator. There's just a, and like you can't breathe anymore, and you know that that was your last breath. It's uh, it's not a happy moment. Oh wow! And uh, the training you do. So how, how how much time do you have? You know, I could see the exit. Well, you have, how how long can you hold your breath? Oh, but were you trained <laughs> to do longer than a few? Like I mean. I, me, look, I, I, I did. I did. I did. Uh, train for like like apnea diving, like like breath hold diving. Uh, when you need to, you can hold your breath for a fairly long time, as long as you don't panic, like a couple of minutes. Okay. Um, it's kind of weird to say hold your breath because it doesn't really matter whether you breathe the air out or not. It's it's the fact that you can't get more oxygen into your body. Obviously, uh, I could see the exit, but light travels a really long distance inside of a cave. And it's deceiving, particularly you know when you haven't breathed for a minute, because you get a little bit of blackness at the edge of your your vision mm. pretty quickly, particularly when you're like really kicking hard. Mm. And uh, so it wasn't obvious how far I was from uh, the cave exit or entry. Uh, I obviously made it. <laughs> um, that first breath is like the most beautiful breath of air you've ever breathed. I mean, how close did you cut us? Look, I, I don't know, man. I like like I'm here. I guess I guess it was like 45 seconds since the last breath. Did you just have to swim out to it, or you just kick like hell? Like that. That's what the training says. Okay. Lots of people. So not when, when, when you when you when you when you're a technical cave diver, you tend to study like cave deaths. Mm -hmm. it, it is a dangerous sport. Uh, people die pretty routinely. Okay. Um, so you, you go and study, like, well, how do they die? What happened? What evidence do they have? Their body has to be retrieved so you can kind of piece together what happened. And a lot of people sit down. You have a thing called a, a dive slate so you can write underwater, like, dear children, you know, I love you. Daddy died. And, like, you, some people do that. Some people absolutely freak out. Like, they have no fingernails left on their hands. They're, like, trying to dig their way out of the cave. It doesn't work because it's solid rock. Uh, and the people who survive – well, some of them like they just kick like hell mm. to get to get out of there as rapidly so as possible. Like, like oh. don't don't try and like optimize, don't remove your gear, kick like hell, and that's what I did mm -hmm. with all the gear on. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, you just don't have time. Kick like well, hell. Glad you made it. <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so with that with that happy ending, um, <laughs> what, what you know? Give me some. Give me give me a book that you highly recommend for our, our viewers. Gee, look, I've got a really unusual book that I'm reading right now. Okay. It's probably not that mainstream, uh, but it is by a Norwegian writer mm -hmm. called Carl Uwe uh, Nolskar. Uh, the book is called My Struggle. Uh, it's very much me, but it's it's a person trying to reconcile their desire for to achieve outstanding artistic merit while also just being a normal person, having children, having a family, living a normal life, not a great mm -hmm. artistic life, uh, like the kind of thing that one reads about or associates with a Van Gogh or a Monet or something like that, but it's not in actual fact uh, realistic. Um, some other books I've read recently, like Lawrence, Lawrence Krauss's books. He's a professor of theoretical physics at mm. Princeton, I believe, but writes excellent lay uh, texts about like the universe, physics, problems within science, and so on. Okay, well, we'll link those below. Yeah, in the show notes. Um, what do you think that is? Like, like, give me a common misconception that people have about life or business, or like you know, like a deep insight you have from your journey. <laughs> like, what, like something specifically where people, almost everyone gets it wrong. It's not about this; it's about that. You know, as successful entrepreneurs, we think that everything will get better when we achieve the kind of success that most people only dream of or mm. for which it's not, not real for them. Uh, it's not true, as you know. Mm. You become wealthy, uh, yeah. you achieve success, and life gets harder because it's like, well, well like what, what do I do now? What um, what summit do I conquer from here? Uh, 
you know, I've, 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 I met the goal, like, but I've got to live the rest of my life. It's not intuitive before you've experienced it. That, Very similar that to what he said. Oh yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, we're, we're super close, right? Yeah, so exactly. <laughs> makes sense. Yeah. But that, that's always like a big surprise for everyone. Uh, and I, yeah, we obviously talk to a lot of other up and coming entrepreneurs. We try to tell them that, that, you know, like the journey is really like the best bit. Um, having the outcome of the journey or achieving, like ending the journey is is kind of sad, actually. Mm. Agreed. You have to get off the treadmill at some point. <laughs> um, tell me a country that you haven't visited that you really want to, you just haven't done yet. And tell me why you haven't done it yet. Haven't visited. I visited, you know, I've been really fortunate. I visited a lot. Mm. Um, I'd really like to go to Nicaragua. Okay. Uh, it just seems like kind of so different. Mm. Um I have like flown over Nicaragua a few times. Uh, I happen to not just enjoy wine, but also cigars. Mm -hmm. And Nicaragua probably makes the best cigars in the world. Better than Cuba? In my opinion, yes. Okay. Um, for a whole host of reasons, maybe for another show. I think Cuba is just more about the fact that, you know, you couldn't get them. Cuba has like the name recognition, the scarcity. Yeah. Uh, it's like the origin of, of cigars. But they've been kind of perfected in places like Nicaragua and the Dominican okay. Republic in a way that is not possible in Cuba. My dad in, in likes Cuba. those Cubans. I, I was trying to get him some Nicaraguan. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So it just seems like an interesting, different place, traditional. Uh, I'd love to go there one day. Okay. If you could tell your 16-year-old self one thing, what would it be? Very different to what we've been talking about, um, health, focus on health. Okay. Uh, the funny thing about aging – uh, is that you realize that like health is like a thing that you have and you, you're only really losing it or maintaining it. You don't, you don't get new health. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what yeah, I tell you, myself. You kind of peak it, you peak it like your early twenties and then it all goes down from there. Jeez. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember at different points in my career, the ergonomicists mm -hmm. would come by and like tell you to sit properly. And, and I'm like, what like, the hell are you talking about? about? Exactly. And then one day you wake up and you're like, you can't get out of bed. Yeah, and I, have, <laughs> I, I have a kneeling chair I use for my, my yeah. own. Because yeah. it's just better. From, I mean, I, I used to get pretty tight legs sitting in an old chair. Yeah. That would be my, my strong advice to any up and coming entrepreneur would be develop very healthy habits to care for yourself, not just your mind, but your physical body, mm. your mind too. Well, what would be your one daily habit that you'd recommend people take that would do? Look, yoga and meditation are incredible ways of what time do you wake physical up? and mental fitness. Um, look, I, I don't have the world's best sleep hygiene. Mm. <laughs> so usually about like 5.30 or something like that. But, you know, sit there reading Twitter and, yeah. and whatnot. And Sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But when, when, I'm, when I'm feeling really good about myself and, and in a good spot, I, I like to wake up at about 6. Uh, just get the day underway. I like to go to bed kind of early, probably like 10 p.m. Okay. What's next for you? Like you're busy building definitive intelligence. Let's assume you have a nice big uh, exit there and it's, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. What would you do afterwards? And by the way, I'm, I, yeah, I, for the record, I'm, I'm an investor in your company. <laughs> right. So I definitely want to see you have a nice <laughs> yes. big exit. But what's, what, you know, what then? You know, I think what I'd really like to do, I said I'd, I'd do this after autonomic but did not. I'd like to see if I could pursue like another life like get good at something else besides technology. Mm. You can already see that I've had these all consuming kind mm. of passions and, mm. and hobbies and professional pursuits in my life. I had, uh, I really love mathematics uh, and I, but I'd love to learn about something unintuitive, like something I don't know about yet and, and gain a degree of mastery and awareness of, uh, of that as well in the kind of second half of my life. Never ending pursuit for knowledge. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Gavin, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for having me. Good having you.